we're continuing our series, Lead Like Jesus. Lead Like Jesus. Uh, we're talking about this because the truth of the matter is, regardless of who you think you are, you are a leader in some form or fashion. Whether it's in your class, at your home, in your neighborhood, at your office, you lead somebody. Somebody's influenced by you. They watch what you do. We're all leaders. And, if we're call, and we're not just called to attend church on a Sunday. This is a small aspect. This is a fun aspect. We get to hang out. But truthfully, the gospel following Jesus is living it out in our lives. How do we live it, in our, live it out in our lives? We lead like Jesus. Last week we talked about the heart of a leader. It all starts with the heart. Today I'm excited to share about the hands of a leader. The hands of a leader. Here's the thing. Good leaders are typically skilled. They're talented, they're smart, they, they, they're hardworking people. But the difference between a good leader and a great leader is that great leaders don't just rely on their own hands. They empower other people to come along and work with them. Good leaders know how to use their hands. Great leaders know how to equip others to use theirs. Why is this important? Because good leaders can accomplish a lot on your own, but you'll always accomplish more with other people. Even Michael Jordan, the greatest basketball player of all time, he said this, talent wins games, teamwork wins championships. Talent wins a game, but teamwork accomplishes something of significance. A great leader knows how to get everyone's hands involved to work as a team. There's an African proverb, I'm sure you heard it. You want to go fast, go alone. You want to go far, go together. John Wooden, a, a great basketball coach, he said this, it takes 10 hands to score a basket. What's he saying? Well, he's saying even though on the stat sheet only one person gets credit when they score, the truth of the matter is it takes a team every time they put that ball in the hoop. It takes teams. Teams matter. What's our purpose here at Lovejoy Church? To love, to serve, to lead. To love God, to love others. To serve God, to serve others, and to lead people to God. But the truth is, we'll never accomplish all that God has given us to accomplish by ourselves. We just won't. We have to work together. That's why one of the things we do almost every service, uh, we pray for other churches in the area. Now, like this week we didn't because we were praying for uh, what's happened in the politics. But usually in that section of the service, we pray for other churches. Why? Because we realize we want to reach thousands in western New York for Christ. And we'll never do it alone. It's not about our church. It's not about love, joy. It's not about me. It never has been. It's about the kingdom of God advancing in our region and changing and helping people's lives. And whoever's going to help us, we're going to join with them and link arms and help reach more people for Jesus. But it's also in our church, there's teamwork involved, right? So we're a part of other churches, but in our church... We need all of us. It's not just about past me or Pastor Ron or Pastor Claire. It's not about, no, it's about all of us serving together. It takes all of us who serve every week, who invite people to church. You online watchers who are sharing it and telling other people. It's about the people who give. All this takes money to go. And it only happens because people are contributing and giving as a team to work together to win people for Jesus. In fact, I want to share with you a really great scripture you've probably heard before, uh, you might have heard before, but I want to share it to you in the context of teamwork. It's in Matthew 9.35, and it says this, verse, chapter 9, verse 35 and 36, say this. Jesus traveled through all the towns and villages of that area, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were confused and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus is doing the work. He's doing the work. He's preaching. He's teaching. He's healing sicknesses and diseases. And then Jesus, he's doing all the work by himself. And then he sees a crowd of people, and he has compassion on them. I was reading one commentary, and they explained that Greek verb compassion, it actually is more like he had a gut reaction. He's doing all this work. He's praying for people. He's preaching. He's teaching. And he has this gut reaction when he sees the crowds of people. And he realizes they're like sheep without a shepherd. He realizes there's not enough workers to get all that done. There's all these people he needs. And he has this gut reaction to see all these people who need help. And so what Jesus says next is very profound. And we often get it misunderstood. In the very next verse, in verse 37, he says, He said to his disciples, The harvest is great. But the workers are few. 
So pray to the Lord who's in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his field. Jesus uses this word harvest. Harvest is like a metaphor, it's an expression saying that people are ready to receive Jesus. He's saying the harvest is ready, it's ripe, it's white, right? It's saying this, that there's actually a lot of people who are ready to receive Jesus. Let me tell you something. The darker, more difficult our world gets, the more opportunity we have to share the love and the freeing power of Jesus. The harvest is ready. The problem was there wasn't enough workers There's not all hands on deck. There's not enough people to bring in the harvest. It's funny because we often pray for the harvest. We often pray that people get saved, which isn't a bad thing to do. It's a good thing to do. But Jesus didn't tell us to pray, which you could pray for the harvest. He told us to pray that God would send more workers, more volunteers, more people who are ready to put their hands in and get their hands dirty, put their hands to the plow and bring in the harvest. Jesus understood this, teamwork. And in direct response to these verses, the next verse, chapter 10, verse 1, he says this, Jesus called his 12 disciples together and gave them authority to cast out evil spirits and to heal every kind of disease and illness. Jesus gives his 12 disciples authority. He said, whoa, look at all these people who need help. And he goes to his disciples and says, you guys got to do it. He gives them authority to do exactly what he was doing. His two hands turned into 24 more hands. Jesus gave him authority, and and a couple verses later, he sends him out to do the work. It's going to take all of us to accomplish what God has called us to accomplish. We need all hands on deck. Even Jesus didn't work alone. He chose to work with us and to use us to accomplish what he's called us to accomplish. Now, to encourage us, to help us remember this, and to really encourage all of us that every single person here, every single person watching online, you have something important to offer. You are all valuable. And to encourage us and to remind us, I have one big thought of the day, one big idea of the day, and it's this. A little becomes a lot in the hands of Jesus. A little becomes a lot in the hands of of Jesus. When I'm willing to take the little I have and give it to Jesus, it becomes a lot. And so don't think you're insignificant. Don't think you don't have a lot to offer. Don't think anything because all of us together will accomplish what God has called us to do because a little becomes a lot in the hands of Jesus. And the main story I want to look at today, it's a really cool story. It's kind of titled, Jesus Feeds the 5,000. It's a cool story. We're going to read it out of the Gospel of John. And it's a miracle where Jesus feeds a ton of people with very little food. But the cool thing about this story is um, out of the four Gospels, okay, there's four Gospels uh, that they are the written story of when Jesus walked the earth. Four people took time to write down, document very carefully everything that happened. There's four of them, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Out of those four Gospels, besides the resurrection, there's only one miracle that is repeated, that is told in all four of those stories. And it's this story we're going to read today. It's really cool. So this is a cool miracle that's happening. All four Gospels have it. Occasionally I might pull out some other information that's not directly written in the Gospel of John, but it's written in other Gospels, and you kind of help fill in some of the gaps, just so you know. But we're going to read out of the Gospel of John, chapter 6. We're going to read verses 5 to 7 first. It says this. Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for him. Turning to Philip, one of his disciples, he asked, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? He was testing Philip, for he already knew what he was going to do. Philip replied, even if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. So let's understand what's happening. There's this huge crowd listening to Jesus preach. And he's preaching, and he's preaching, and, and, and all of a sudden they see all these people. We later find out that it's not, it's 5,000, but it's, in other Gospels, it's not just 5,000 people. It's 5,000 men only. A lot of scholars and commentaries believe it's at least 10,000. Upwards of 20,000 people are listening to Jesus preach. A lot of people. And Jesus turns to Philip. Now, why would he ask Philip where to get food? Well, it's because Philip grew up where they were. Right where they currently were, this was Philip's hood. He knew where they were. He knew where the shops would, where he knew if it was possible, what stores, what are the restaurants, what places they could get food. 
right? And he knew it was impossible to get this much food this last minute for all these people. It was impossible for two reasons. First, they didn't have enough money, right? I mean, how would you even pay for that many people nowadays? I mean, imagine buying chicken wings for that. I mean, chicken wings are so expensive. Sorry, it's just close to home. But, you know, it's expensive, you know. Other versions, they say it would take eight months' salary to maybe buy enough food for everyone to have a little. Eight months. That's how many people there were. Right? So it was impossible they didn't have enough money. But the second reason it was impossible is because where would they get all that food that last minute? Even if they had enough money, you got to understand, there's no McDonald's or Burger King's or Five Guys or Moe's. Right? There's no pizza places. Right? You just can't go and order all this food. It was impossible to feed that many people. They were in an impossible situation. But what does it say? It says Jesus already knew what he was going to do. There was no solution, no way to fix it, but Jesus knew what to do. Jesus already knows the solution, the miracle, the help you need. You might feel like you're in an impossible situation. You might feel like you'll never dig yourself out of this hole. Like how are these things going to be fixed? But Jesus knows what you need. You might not have enough money to fix it, enough ideas to solve it, enough patience to wade through it, enough grace to wade through it, enough strength to get through it, but Jesus has what you need. You might feel like you only have a little left, a little time, a little energy, a little money, a little strength, but that's okay. Why? Because a little becomes a lot in the hands of Jesus. Verse 8 goes on to say this, Then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. There's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. But what good is that with this huge crowd? So let's just stop here for a moment. A young boy comes up. He's got five barley loaves and two fish. What's that among so many? Let's look at the food he has. First of all, the bread he has, I like the Gospel of John because it explains to us that it's barley loaves. Barley is For the poor, poor, poorest of the poorest people. In fact, there's something called the Mishnah. It's like Jewish writings. And in the Mishnah, it talks about barley. And they use the terminology, the uh, the, the barley's for the beast or barley's for animals. Saying barley, you only give that to like the dogs. You don't give it to humans. It's it's only the poorest of the poor people would eat barley. So he comes up with like five of the, the poorest of the poorest bread you could eat. And then the fish... Let's talk about the fish. I remember one time I was in Mexico and a pastor told me, he's like, listen, Jonathan, don't eat the fish. I go, what do you mean don't eat the fish? He goes, well, it might have been caught fresh today, but you don't know how long it was sitting in the baking sun. Now think about how much more difficult that would be 2,000 years ago. In fact, fresh fish was an unheard of luxury because there's no way of transporting it any distance while keeping it edible. But... There was something known in Galilee. Galilee was known throughout the whole Roman Empire for their pickled fish. Pickled fish. Now, they weren't any bigger than sardines, these tiny little fish that were pickled. Right? You, like you can read Homer's Iliad, and it will talk about uh, this kind of relish pickle thing that they would eat with bread. That's kind of what's happening here, these pickled little fish. So he has five barley loaves, the cheapest of the cheapest bread, and two pickled tiny sardines. Now, I'm just being honest with you. That's about as much food as I eat when I'm thinking about what I'm going to eat, right? Do you know what I mean? Like you're saying, that's what I'll eat while I'm thinking, what do I want to eat? I could eat that, and it won't even phase me. Like, you know, you're doing Weight Watchers. You don't even include that. That doesn't count. That's what I'm thinking about what the meal is. They have all this food. And yet, I love this little boy because he's not embarrassed to bring what he has to Jesus. It's interesting because Andrew kind of doubted him, yet he still got his way through, even though he was looked down about because it was poor food, because it wasn't enough food. Why? How amazing is that? Because what? A little becomes a lot in the hands of Jesus. When we're willing to take what we have and give it to Jesus, he could turn it into what we need. You might not think you have enough. You might think you only have a little to offer, that you're not good enough. But when we willingly give it to Jesus, he makes it enough. I remember this one time, somebody wanted to meet with me, and and, uh, they wanted to meet with me about a topic that was, very difficult to talk about. I wasn't very versed in it, and, I, and I, I, I wanted them to meet with, like, my dad. You know, my dad, Pastor Ron, he's, like, the best care pastor in the world. He's got all the experience. I know, he's amazing. So I'm like, meet with Pastor Ron. They're like, no, I want to meet with you. And I felt so inadequate. 
I'm like, man, I just, this is not my thing. I'm like, I could preach, but sometimes with these topics, I don't know what I'm going to do. Sometimes I'm not patient. And, and I'm like, Lord, I'll just, whatever I have to offer, I'll, I'll just give my best. But I just got to trust you, God. And I'm talking, talking, and we're talking to this person. And I just say something. And it was interesting because all of a sudden their whole demeanor changes. Kind of like, almost like time froze. And it was almost like I could visually see God speaking to someone. And through a phrase I said, God began to reveal to them stuff that has been said to them for years, but it really helped them. It was nothing I did. It was all the Holy Spirit. But when I offered the little I had, even though I felt inadequate, even though I didn't want to be there, even though I wasn't sure, God began to speak to somebody. Why? Because a little becomes a lot in the hands of Jesus. And it's the same thing with you. When we willingly give the little we have to Jesus, say, God, I'll do what you tell me to do, even though it's not much, even though I feel a little embarrassed, even though I'm a little nervous, I just trust you. Why? Because a little becomes a lot in the hands of Jesus. It was interesting, too, because of the story this boy brought this little food to, to Jesus, but Andrew's comments are interesting. Andrew brings the boy, he goes, this is what he's got, but what good is that? That's not going to do anything. Why am I even bringing this boy to you, Jesus? This isn't going to help us. We saw Andrew's real feelings about the situation. It's almost like he brought the boy to Jesus out of obligation. Like, I'll bring him, but it ain't going to help. And what's interesting is that Andrew didn't have faith in the boy. Andrew didn't have faith in what the boy offered. But Jesus still made it work. Because it's not dependent on what other people think about you. It's not dependent on what other people call you or what other people expect about you. It's when you have the little you have and you put it in the hands of Jesus, he could make it enough. And even if people doubt you, even if you don't think you have what it takes, that's okay because you know what the truth is? I'll let you in on everybody's hidden secret. None of us have what it takes. None of us do. Some of us put a better show on than others, but none of us have what it takes. And what you have becomes all that you need When you put it in the hands of Jesus. Let's continue the story. Verse 10 through 13 say this. Tell everybody to sit down, Jesus said. So they all sat down on the grassy slopes. The men alone numbered about 5,000. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks to God, and distributed them to the people. Afterward, he did the same with the fish, and they all ate as much as they wanted. After everyone was full, Jesus told his disciples, now gather the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. Nothing is wasted. So they picked up the pieces and filled 12 baskets with scraps left by the people who had eaten from the five barley loaves. What did Jesus say as they gathered it? He said, gather the leftovers so nothing is wasted. When I read this, those words as I was studying, I felt like God gave me like a specific word for some people. That nothing in your life will be wasted if you give it to Jesus. Some people feel like I've already wasted my life. I've done too much wrong. I'm a waste. I'm not worth it. My my life is falling to pieces. Nothing is good. But when you can give what you have to Jesus, nothing is wasted. Years you thought were lost can be redeemed. Healing can come. Life change could happen. When you give the little you have to Jesus, he makes sure nothing is wasted. You are not a waste. You are not worthless. You are important and Jesus has something for you he just might be waiting for you to give him what you have left because a lot a little becomes a lot in the hands of Jesus what I love about this story the evangelist in me is that Andrew didn't realize what he was doing when he brought someone to Jesus He didn't think it would be any good. He didn't think it was going to work out. He didn't have faith in it. But what did he do? He just brought the boy to Jesus. He brought someone to Jesus even though he didn't believe in it. And we never know what's going to happen when we start bringing people to Jesus. We don't know what will happen when Jesus gets his hands on somebody. We don't know. But we're not called to know 
how or what or why or when, or when, we're just called to bring people to Jesus and let Jesus do what he does best. We serve people, and Jesus, he saves them. We just bring what we have and let Jesus do the rest. In fact, in the grand scheme of life, like if you kind of take like this global picture of the world, even if you just think of America, even if you just think of Buffalo and Western New York, it feels so big, so much, too many problems, too many mistakes, too dark of a world, too many battles going on that I don't have enough to offer. How could I make a difference when this whole world is so messed up? But that's the beauty of many hands helping out. Because the little I have, combined with the little you have, put in the hands of Jesus, becomes a great miracle. You might be serving in Forever Kids. You might be serving in our nursery as a host in the cafe, in the AVL, the band, the Welcome Center, security. All these places you could serve. More places to serve. You might be serving. You're like, what, what am I doing here? What, what is this really happening? What, what, what's going on? Like, why does this matter? But this is the beautiful thing about it. You're helping people to hear about Jesus. You're bringing people to Jesus. And you may not see it every day. You may not understand it. But we never know what's going to happen when we just bring somebody to Jesus. And there's people watching online. There's people every week. We're hearing testimonies of people getting saved, of new people coming. You're helping people come to know Jesus. You never know what happens, just like Andrew, when you bring someone to Jesus. Maybe you feel like you don't have a lot to offer. Maybe you feel like what you have isn't good enough. Or you're just in doubt that you could help anyone at all. That's okay. Because when you just give whatever you have to Jesus... It becomes enough because the little you do have becomes a lot in the hands of Jesus. And it might be time for some people here to start serving. Even though you feel like you don't have enough to offer. But guess what? What you do have becomes great when you give it to Jesus. It might be time to start getting involved to help people. Maybe you're like, listen, i got to do something. Then after the service, go to the Welcome Center, say it's time. Let me, get me involved. Get your name and number. We will contact you, get you somewhere where you can serve. Why? Because we can't do it alone. It's not about a couple people. It's not about one church. It's about God's kingdom advancing in western New York to change your region for Christ. We need everybody's help. Maybe for some people, it's time to start giving. Let's just be honest. No one likes to ask for money. No one likes to talk about money. But the truth is it takes resources to do what we're doing. Check out the kids' programs. That's not cheap. Check out what's happening here. It takes resources to improve and to keep advancing and to grow. And maybe some people are like, it's not, well, just give what you have. God will make it a lot. Give what you feel a lot. Give, and God will make it a lot. At one time, the Apostle Paul, he was writing to a church. And he's writing to this church, and he says, when I take the gifts you give to people, they thank God because of your giving. When you give, other people are thanking God because of your generosity. How amazing is that, that we get to be involved in other people reaching God. We get to be involved in supporting 30 missionaries and missions organizations around the world. When we give, others around the world and locally, people here, right here, are thanking God because of your generosity. Maybe for others, it's time you start inviting people to church. It's time as you live the light out in your life and people ask what's differently, you just gently tell them what's going on. You let them know what's happening. For you online, you share our stuff. You like our stuff. Maybe it's time we all put a little hand in you. Maybe you don't know a lot of people. Maybe you think who you invite won't come. Don't worry about that. When the little you have is put in the hands of Jesus, it becomes a lot. Why do you invite people to Jesus? Because you never know what's going to happen when you bring someone to Jesus. You just trust him with the details. Back to where we started. Jesus said it's not the harvest that's the problem. It's the workers. We don't have enough hands to get the work done. And just like the little boy with five loaves and two fish, when you give... The little you have to Jesus, he can make it a lot. 
It's not going to happen with just one of us. The hands of the leader is how many people's hands we could get involved to do what God has called us to do. Maybe today... You're somebody who would say, you know, I've never really given anything to Jesus. I'm not really sure about this Jesus thing. It's probably because you've never asked Jesus to come into your heart and to forgive you of your sins. Because the truth is we've all sinned. We've all made mistakes. None of us is perfect. But the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, is that he forgives you of all of your sins. The Bible says when we confess our sins, what does that mean? It's like when I admit it. When I admit I'm not perfect, that I can't do this alone, that I've made mistakes, the Bible says Jesus is faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins. How does that happen? Well, one, you confess it. Or one, you confess, you believe it in your heart that he died on the cross. On the third day he rose again. He's alive today. You believe it, and then you confess it. You say, God, I admit that I'm not perfect. And maybe today it's that opportunity for somebody here or for those people watching online. It's time. You say, you know, I I believe it. How do I confess it? How do you confess it is this. You just admit it to God that you're not perfect. And what I want to do is take a moment just to pray. Maybe there's somebody online. Maybe there's somebody here who say, listen, today I'm not sure if I'd go to heaven if I die. I'm not sure where I stand with God. I'm not sure about this Jesus thing. But you want to be sure today, it's really simple. I want to pray for you. Before we go on our service, I just want to ask everyone to bow their heads and close their eyes. And maybe there's some people here or people watching online who'd say, you know what, I want to do this. Is there anybody here, you can just slip your hand up in the air. I want to pray for you. Anybody right now who would want to, who'd want to pray this prayer with me, just raise your hand up in the air. Any hands? Anybody? If you're watching online, I'm still going to pray for everybody here. Lord, I just thank you. That you're faithful and just to forgive us. Man, that I was such a sinner. But you still chose to die for me. If there's anybody out there who say, you know what, I just want to be forgiven. I'm not sure. You could just say a simple prayer like this in your heart. Say, God, I admit, I confess, I'm not perfect. I've made mistakes. But Lord, just forgive me of all of my sins. Thank you that you died on the cross for me and you rose again and you're alive today. Thank you for giving me, thank you for giving me eternal life, but also a new fresh start here on earth to be who you've called me to be. Thank you that no part of my life is ever gonna be wasted when I give it to you, Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. For the rest of us, maybe you are a Christian, you've accepted Jesus in your heart, but there's something you're holding back. There's a way you could kind of get involved. You could be a part of the team. I don't know where it is. It might be here at church. It might be at your school. It might be at your office. It might be at home. It might be in another ministry. I don't know. Maybe it's your call. You, you haven't been giving. It's time to give. Maybe you haven't been serving. It's time to serve. Maybe you haven't been inviting people. You've been shy about your faith. Maybe it's time to get involved. It's not going to happen with just one person. It happens when all of us gives the little we think we have. And we put it in the hands of Jesus. And he makes it a lot. So maybe I want to encourage you as I end and we get ready to sing another song. I want to just pray for you. I want to pray for all of us. Sometimes we feel inadequate. What are we going to do? I can't do this. I can't do that. What am I have to offer? You don't have to have all the answers. Just give what you have to Jesus and he'll make a difference. Lord, I just pray that you would just speak to hearts and speak to us this morning. For many of us who have called to be a part of this team, to be a part of a bigger picture in western New York, reaching thousands of people for Jesus. Lord, Jesus, you said it. The harvest is ripe. The harvest is plentiful. The harvest is ready. That's not the issue. Believe it or not, the issue is we don't have enough people in the fields working. We don't have enough hands on deck. And so, Lord, I pray you'd begin to raise up more people to just be willing to trust you with the little we have and that you'll make it enough. Lord, I thank you for the lives that will be changed in Lovejoy Church, through Lovejoy Church, and around Lovejoy Church, simply because a bunch of people say, I'm just going to give Jesus what I have. It may not be much. Someone may look down on me. 
I'm not confident, I'm embarrassed, but I'm going to give it to Jesus because he'll make it enough. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.